Today I want to talk about something I struggle with. Is that okay? I struggle with my mouth. I do. And uh, today we're going to talk about training our mouth. Training our mouth for healthy relationships. And that's what it's all about. The health of our relationships is really based upon the health of our speech in those relationships. And uh, just to let you know, I, I don't stand up here uh, conquering it because you know what? I grew up in Long Island, New York, in the suburbs of New York City. I'm the third son. I have a brother that's seven years old named David, another brother named Glenn, and I was a little runt. And so I had a fight with my mouth. That's how I beat things. I, I could do a lot with my mouth. And I would manipulate, and if they touched me, I'd scream, Ow! Leave your brother alone! Wah, wah, wah. I'm like, <laughs> Are you okay? Oh, I'm doing fine. You know, that's kind of how I did the thing growing up. And then as I got older, I, you know, you kind of say sly remarks or sarcastic in school. I was the guy in the back that would make all the jokes. And yeah, I was bad, okay? But I used my mouth. And unfortunately, I, I, I grew up that way. And even today, I struggle sometimes. Anyone knows? We know, that. we know that already. You don't need to tell us. But sometimes our mouths, if we're not careful, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we, we got to learn how to speak rightly. We'll talk about that today, how to train our mouths, because all of us struggle with it. In fact, if you look at Proverbs 18, 20 to 22, it says this. It says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his or her mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Now listen to this one. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now when you read that, you're like, okay, he's talking about the, the mouth. And now all of a sudden he throws the wife in there. What's that have to do with it? At, he's obviously going to another topic. No, he's not. There's something linked up in relationships with your mouth and my mouth. What we speak determines the course and the direction and the health of our relationships. If you have toxic talk, you're going to have a toxic relationship. So it is very much involved with marriage and all relationships. The health of relationships are based upon how we speak. So how do we train our mouth to be right? Okay? And we're talking about the power of speech. And... This is, the, this is the good news. If you feel bad about it and you struggle with your mouth, this is the good news. God can forgive us of all of our sins if we repent, if we take ownership of our sins. We take ownership of how we've blown it. You see, this is the truth. You can't give something away until you own it. Legitimately. You cannot give something away legitimately unless you own it. And you own your sin. Say, God, it's me. I was wrong. I was wrong. If you say that, then God's good. Great. I've been waiting for you to take ownership. Now I'll take it from you, and I'll remove the guilt from you. So this is not a, a time today to beat us up, to make us feel like we're terrible. No, this is an opportunity to help us all grow, because, listen, everyone in this room needs to help in this area. Even if you don't speak much, you speak it in your mind. You see, your marriage, your relationships will only be as healthy as the way you talk with your mouth. That's the way it is. And we were all created in the image of God. I don't know if you recognize that, but God spoke and then stuff happened. God said, let there be, and there was. We're made in his image. And so just as God created the world through what he spoke, you create your world and what you speak, and I create my word and world and what I speak. It may be a fantasy world, but your world nevertheless is controlled and predicated and created by what you say. And some of you can think of some wonderful words that you've heard growing up that were just really encouraging. And maybe some of you have heard some horrible words. Like, you'll never amount to anything. Why can't you be like your brother? Oh, I've never used that. Why can't you be like your sister? And so what happens is we have incredible power in our mouth. And we have to end up eating the fruit of our words, even if it's not good fruit. So what do we do about that? Well, the Bible says in... in Proverbs 18, 20, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips. And the word fruit there actually means seed. So every time you speak, you're throwing out seed, like a baseball player on sunflower seeds. Okay, you're always spitting out seeds. Every time you talk, you're throwing out seeds. The question is, what kind of seeds are you and I throwing out? Because guess what? They germinate and they grow, and that's what begins to happen. 
if you speak horrible seeds come out of your mouth, you better pray for crop failure. And you think about it. Like migratory animals, for example. You hear the whales and the birds. They know where to fly. They, they'll, they'll have their young. They'll go thousands of miles away. And somehow they find their way back because they, they don't know why, but they think they can see the, the magnetic fields that help them find their way back. If you and I could see with our eyes what our words did, we would all take it a lot more seriously. Absolutely. And in our culture today, come on, we're really loose with the lips, aren't we? Think about it. Think about the things we say. Uh, think about the, the political climate we got going on right now. What, you haven't seen nothing yet. I mean, there's going to be talk, and this person, that person, there's all kinds of talk, ripping people down, all the comedians. If you watch most comedians, it's always at someone's expense, is it not? Rarely is it ever something that's uplifting. And if we're not careful, we, let me tell you a story. And then you have the Facebook and the Instagram and the Twitter and the Snapchat, all this talk, 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 and stuff goes around, and you can see what happens within cultures. And people say absolutely unbelievable things with their mouth, and I've done it too. And Satan seizes on that opportunity because we do have an enemy. I'm not saying that Satan goes after you, but there's a kingdom of darkness, and he's the leader of it. And they want to work on our ignorance. If they can get us to say silly and hurtful things, then it can limit the scope of God's blessing in your life and also bring difficulty to other people. You see, he works on, our in he works on that whole thing. Now, I want to bring your attention. Jesus has a lot to say about the tongue. In fact, Jesus began his ministry, and as he began to get some traction in his ministry, he began to cast out demons and heal the sick and all that. And the religious crowd did not like him. There were two types of folks in his day. There were the, there were the Sadducees, because they didn't believe in the, in the Bible, basically. They were the liberal church of the day. That's why they were so sad, you see. And then, <laughs> thank you. Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. All right. So, and then you had the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the strict ones. They're the ones that did everything right. They're the ones that point at you and say, you can't dance, you can't shoot, you can't, all that kind of stuff, right? They're, they're real strict. And so they said to Jesus, the reason why they're casting out demons is because you're the prince of demons. You're Beelzebub. They started calling him basically that what he was doing through the person in the work of the Holy Spirit was demonic. And so what does Jesus do? Stop it, guys. No, he doesn't do that. He talks to them, and he speaks the words of truth. And here it is found in Matthew 12, 31 through 37. He has a lot to say about what we speak, and there's a lot of principles and a lot of truth wrapped up in the Scripture. We're going to unpack it a little bit today, and then we're going to look in the book of James. But this is what he says. Therefore, Jesus is speaking, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. There's unpardonable sin. Oh, my goodness, I've done it. If you're wearing that you did it, you haven't. The unpardonable sin is when you don't even care anymore. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, I don't want to listen to it. And you totally ignore it where you lose all ability to hear. And this is what he says. And this is the religious crowd he's talking to, not the prostitutes, not the tax collectors. Okay? And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, verse 32. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Either make the tree good and it's fruit good, or make the tree bad, and it's fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. So what is the tree? The tree is you. The fruit is your words. So if you say, I'm an apple tree, and you're putting out lemons, guess what you are? An apple tree. No, a lemon tree. But you can swear up and down, I am an apple tree. No, if stuff's coming out of you, that's what the tree you're coming up. And so this is what he says. This is, look how Jesus, how, how nice he is to them. You brood of vipers. How can you, listen, there's a time to speak the truth in love and power. There's a time. I'm not saying we have to walk around like Barney the dinosaur. I love you, you love me, and bunts around. No, Jesus was not that way. He spoke the truth in love. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For, listen to this one. Ugh. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, listen to this one, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless 
word they speak. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, you thought Siri and um, what's the other assistant called? Alexa, who are copying everything down. The government's watching you. No, I'm just kidding. That's not happening. Although it might be happening. But think about it. In the natural, we can record every single conversation. They do, by the way, have software. And if you say some tag words, the alarms will go off and the authorities will be. So be careful what you say. Anyhow, but it's true. So if we can do it in the natural, think about what God, then I'm doomed. I'm doomed. What am I supposed to do? Every thoughtless word I've said, I've said a lot of bad things. Well, how do we do that? Well, this is the good news. The good news is that what Jesus did is enough to forgive us of our sins. And so if you and I will take ownership and say, I blew it, I was wrong. For those of you that understood what I just said, you're showing your age. I'm not going to mention the fonts, but if you can actually say you're wrong, What happens is you take ownership, give it to God. His blood is enough to erase the tapes that Richard Nixon wish he had. But your neighbor may not may remember it. Your spouse may remember it. Your friends may remember it, but God doesn't remember it. And that's all that really matters. You don't have to walk around with that. So listen, this is not beat me up, walk out of here all wounded. No, this is an opportunity for us to change our lives the way we speak. You can always tell the condition of your heart by your words. If you want a heart checkup, I didn't mean that. I, I didn't really mean it. Yes, you did. You wouldn't have said it if you didn't mean it. We speak stuff out. Now, sometimes we're hurt and upset, and we say things we really don't want to say, but it shows there's something going on in your heart, in my heart, when we say hurtful things. And say things, I can't stand you. I wish, why did I ever marry you? I want a divorce. I hate you. Why was I even born? You you guys are you guys are Hitlers, you know, all these things you say to people. Your words speak about your heart. And uh, Jesus tells us we have to give an account for every word. If you're in the garage and you're trying to, or you're in the house and you're trying to put up curtain rods and you hit your finger with the hammer and you blah 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 blah. guess what that's in your heart God records every word that we say and all words are crucial and have consequential they have consequence in what happens so since our words have seeds let's talk about how do we deal with it okay here's the first thing we gotta say Jesus refers to our words as fruit the second thing he says, he reveals that our worst sin is committed by our mouth. Think about that for a moment. That's the worst sin we do is by our mouth. That's the unpardonable sin. It's not done by any other way but our mouth. He also, he also tells us that our words reveal our hearts, and he tells us we'll give an account for every single word that we say. Aren't you glad that Jesus paid for our sins and that we can go to him? Now, by the way, it isn't like this. Okay, Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell her off. I'm going to tell him off, and then I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And that's not what we're talking about. That's called cheap, foolish grace. I'm talking about really taking ownership of what you've done. There are basically three laws of sowing and reaping. Okay, I know we don't live in a farming community today, but there's some things about this. And here's the first law, okay? You reap what you sow. What you sow by throwing the seed out is what you will reap. And a lot of us throw a lot of bad stuff out when we pray for crop failure. And Galatians 6, 7 through 8, it says the following. It says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, God, you can't, you turn your nose against God. Whatever a man or woman sows, that he will also reap. If we go on. For he who sows to what? The flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So this is what happens. We have some lies about our mouth. We think this. We believe that we can get good fruit, good results from bad fruit. That I can say bad things and have good fruit. No, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Bad words, we don't get good results from bad words. And I've had people come, and and I've done it myself, and I've had people come to the office, and they're talking, they're having trouble in their marriage or trouble with their child, and maybe a, a, a woman will come in or a man will come in, and he'll curse his wife up down, up one side and down the other. And they're saying stuff. Like, I'm like, we're in church, folks. We might blah, 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 blah. And they said, he's a loser. Da, 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 da. And furthermore, and then vice burger, vice burger, vice, <laughs> I'm getting kind of hungry. I'm sorry. 
I want a burger. <laughs> let me, let me, let me uh, wet my palate here. And then the woman will go off the other guy and say all a bunch of things. I wish I never married you. You were lying. You're worthless. You, you, you can't provide for the family. You're a horrible father. You're a horrible dad. You're a horrible wife. You're this. And, and my goodness, you're just sitting there going. And I've never had anyone say in the 20 years I've been involved with this thing called church, never did I hear someone say, thank you. That really helps. <laughs> never have I heard anyone ever say that. No, it hurts. It doesn't help. The problem is, it comes out so easy, doesn't it? I, I, I mean, I, I never forget, I went to Brooklyn to see my friend Paul, who lives in Brooklyn, and I got a little lost, and I parked the car, and I went across the street to a, one of those convenience stores at 7-Eleven or something, and I was talking to the guy outside, asking for directions, and he, and he was very nice, but he, he used expletives. Uh, cross the blankety-blank street and make a right, blankety-blank, blank, blank, I mean, everything is blankety-blank, blank, blank, blank. I'm like, okay, thanks. He wasn't upset. Then I cross the street, and I'm jaywalking, and I, people will give me sign language and call me blankety blank, 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 blank. Then I got back in my car, and someone hit me. Um, and I tell you, there's so much tension that creates. If you use explicit, if you start swearing and speaking like, you jerk, get out of my way. You start speaking that way, you know what you do? You rise the level of your blood pressure. You invite the demonic in your life. Yes, you do. The enemy loves that kind of stuff. It's like putting out garbage and having flies and laying eggs and having maggots. Do you want to live in an environment where you just are like the pig pen from peanuts? You walk around, there's a cloud around you of negativity, of anger, of vitriol. Is that what you want? My friends, it does make a difference what we speak. Oh, that sucks. You start talking that way? You said that in church? Yes, I did. Get over yourself. Okay. The second lie is this, if I, if I say something good, it won't change anything at all. If I, I'll say something nice about her or him, nothing's going to change. That's not true. You keep on speaking life, life and death on the power of the tongue. You keep speaking life. Yeah, but I try to be nice to my wife or him. She said, oh, you're just trying because you heard the sermon today. Or oh, you're just trying because you went to the conference. No, you keep saying life. People are longing for life. If we would just stop trying to defend ourselves, we would say, Lord, what are you doing in someone's life? God's looking for people to speak life and creation. And, man, this is for you, okay? If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, says this. It says that he, this is Jesus, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, okay? So that, this is a classic surgery in scripture. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That was supposed to be funny. Boy, I'm really doing well today, honey. I got to give this up. <laughs> that she might be holy without blemish. I'm dying up here. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing I'm dying up here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. But you know that Jesus washes us with his word? He does. He washes us with his word. And, and, and guys, come on, in our marriages, you want to present, you want to change your wife and present her beautiful. How are we talking about our wife? And I've been guilty of it too. Speak the truth in love. It's hard. I understand that. And so, you know, and this is the truth. Women, generally speaking, of course, women speak three times as much as men. Men talk to communicate and to give information. Women talk to connect, to know what you feel, right? How was your day at the office? Fine. What happened? It was good. How was the movie? Fine. Did the Yankees win? Yeah, it was a good game. What happened? We went to the game. I talked to Sandra. I went to Costco today. I had six samples. I ran into a woman named Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> and she'll go on. I ran into this person. I ran into Cynthia. I mean, the whole church goes to Costco. I don't know if you realize this, but if you don't go to church, go to Costco. Everyone in the church goes to Costco <laughs> because you like the samples. But I got bad news. They're not doing samples because of the coronavirus. So don't go to Costco. So, but she'll tell me what happened to this person, and then this person had this person, and then this person said this person, and then you have a sleepover with girls in your house. All I hear downstairs is my son. 
stop. You know, they're, they're playing these games. It's all you hear. Stop, he killed me. Da, 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 da. You know, the girls are there. <laughs> they want to connect. That's why the women are such problems. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. No, no, I didn't say that. Yes, I did. I take it back. You can't. You said it. Okay. Women are wonderful. They make women, you can have a house, but a woman makes a home, generally speaking. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Amen. You know what it says in 2 Hezekiah 3.18, don't you? Man may be the head, but the woman's the neck that turns the head. There's no such thing as second head. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to get a little, you guys are kind of loosening up a little bit, which I appreciate. Okay, here we, here we go. We've we got to stop here. Okay, the first one is this. You will sow what you reap. Here's the second principle of uh, what we talk about. You reap much more than what you have. When you speak something out, more comes back. I'll give you a case in point. If you have a kernel, a corn kernel, and you take that corn kernel and you put it in the ground and you plant it and you cultivate that, you'll have a stalk that has hundreds of kernels. You take that kernel and you, you plant it, you can plant an entire field full of corn. You take that field and spread it to another field, to another field, and that one kernel of corn can feed the entire world. Do you realize that? That's the power of our words. That's the power of our words that God has given us. Our mouth are disproportioned to what we have back. In fact, it says in Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over what you put into your lap. For the measure you used, it will be measured back to you. Now, here's a fun thing. You ready for this? James chapter 2 says a wonderful things about the tongue. For we all stumble in many things. Can I hear an amen? amen. Why are you so negative? You shouldn't believe that. <laughs> For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his entire body. In other words, this is what the Bible is saying. If you can control your mouth, you're perfect. Is there anyone in this room that's perfect? Don't give an elbow to your spouse. Is there anyone in this room that's perfect? No. Do you know if you could control your tongue, you'd be perfect? That's how difficult it is to control our tongues. That's because the tongue is so powerful. Look what the Bible says. Indeed, we put, in verse 3, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look at the ships. Although they're so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. Whoa! So why even open our mouths at all? What is James saying? He's saying that our tongue's like a little bit, maybe small, but it can steers everything. He also says that it's like a rudder in a ship. He also says that it ignites a forest fire. Think about it. Someone is driving through Southern California, and they're smoking a cigarette. They flick the little thing into the woods, and it hits some dry leaves. The next thing you know, you have a forest fire out of control from one spark. That's what happens with your mouth and my mouth. So we have to really take stock of what we say and watch our mouths. This is what we have to do. It's disproportionate. It is. You say one thing, it gets worse. Here's the third principle. First principle is what? He said, sow what you reap. Second thing is you get more back than you put in. The third one is a delay. It takes, the third one is this. There's a delay between sowing and reaping that differs between seeds. There's a delay. You don't just put a tomato plant in and it goes up the following day. Uh, I, well, I hope I don't, okay, but it's so cute. One of our kids, I won't say which one. Uh, we got some apple seeds. We went in the backyard and, and dug it up and put it in. Every day, the, the child went out there, because I don't want to make him feel bad. The child went out there every day and said, where's the apple tree? Every day. And they started digging it up. It wouldn't happen. You have to set it and forget it. You have to continue to, to cultivate that. And this is what the Bible says in, in Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, he will also reap. For one who sows to his flesh will from his flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows in the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Here, here's the important one here, okay? Hold on to this. And let us not grow weary. Why would he say we grow weary? 
because we grow weary. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if, if we do not give up. So then, when we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. You see, it takes faith when there's a delay. It takes faith to plant seed and believe that's going to come up. God, I've been trying. I've been, I've been telling him. I've been telling her. I've been trying with my mother. I've been trying with my father. I've been trying with my friend. I constantly say the right thing, and nothing comes back. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And this especially happens with children. And what happens is this. When we say words and it doesn't come back automatically, then we get frustrated and we start to nag because we want results right now. How do we change that? Well, I mean, think about the power of prayer. What happens when we're praying, we're throwing out seed. And we can pray as well. Very powerful. It says in 2 Timothy 1.3. This is the Apostle Paul talking about Timothy. Without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. He constantly prays for Timothy. He's making a memorial. He's making a place saying, God, I'm going to pray for this guy till I see the change. We can also see in Acts 10, 4, the same words used, your prayers have come up to me like a memorial. And I believe very strongly that when we pray, God collects every prayer, it says in the Bible. It says he collects them in gold bowls. And we can pray, make a memorial. Do you realize the, pray, the prayers you pray go even after you're gone? Well, I believe that. I believe it's like a, like, a, like a amusement park. We talked about this before. We have that big bucket in the water park, and it gets filled with water. And it's ding, 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 ding. And finally, it gets so full, it goes over. Don't give up on prayer. Keep praying. Keep asking. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. That's what you need to do. You see your prayer. You know what it says in Acts 10.4? Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And when you and I pray, we make a monument before God. And the fourth thing about our mouth is this. Speaking the truth in love. I'm going to tell you a story. I asked for permission. So I want to let everyone know that. If I didn't ask for permission, you'd be worried about me. A number, uh, over eight years ago, we went on vacation uh, to Virginia, Williamsburg area. It was hot, humid. I mean, it was so hot and humid. And we went to Bush Gardens, which is kind of a nice place to go to hang out. And so we're there for several days, and we're having a good old time. Matthew's a very young boy at the point in time, and Sandra's just, you know, she's doing all the work, doing an amazing thing. I'm going on the roller coaster, having a great time with Luke and Hannah and all that, and we're having a great time. It's the end of the day. My wife says, you know, you guys continue on. I'm going to go back to the, to the car, the minivan. I'm going to feed Matthew, take care of him. You go ahead and, you know, have a good time, okay? Like, most, like a good Christian, before we went, we went to Chick-fil-A. I just want to let you know. Two weeks in a row I mentioned Chick-fil-A. And I had a big lemonade. Big, big lemonade with a straw. And I, I drank the whole thing. Okay? At least I left a little left with some ice. Why am I telling you that? You'll see in a moment. So I think some of you are catching it already. So what happens is um, Sandra, it, you know, she's a, she doesn't want to take Matthew out. Matthew has to use the restroom. So he decides to um, use the Chick-fil-A cup. <laughs> Fills it up. You know what's coming. <laughs> Just, I, I, I found something out new. If you, if, you, if you get cut and you're in the middle of the woods, do you know urine is actually pure? Just want to let you know that. <laughs> it actually, it's, it's sterile. It's, it, yeah. But anyhow, so I get back into the car. I'm sweating. It's the end of the day. I see, oh, look at that. I see that lemonade. <laughs> you know, I'm picking it up. I'm looking for it. I can't. You know how your mind tells you, I'm going to have lemonade. And all of a sudden, I'm drinking it, and it's just like this horrible, salty, putrid. I'm like, and while I'm doing it, she's like, my wife's in slow motion, do The whole van's like, Dah! So I drank it, and I'm like, I'm like, praise God. <laughs> I, put it in. I said, you know what? I really appreciate you, honey, coming back to the van, taking care of Matthew. I really appreciate the fact that, you know, you didn't want to bring him outside. You know, there's the, probably the coronavirus in the bathrooms. I like the fact that, you, you know, you used a Chick-fil-A cup, 
that was ingenious of you. And I, you know what? I, I understand that. And Matthew, I love you so much that drinking your urine's a privilege. <laughs> so I said that. We prayed together. We sang, we sang how great is our God and went back to the hotel. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> you would have fired me as your pastor if you heard <laughs> what I said that day. I used no expletives. But, but believe me, if the kids weren't there, I probably would have. Oh, well, get over yourself. So, yeah. So I'm like, what is wrong with you? What are you? Uh... I said all the wrong things. And I went on and on and on. And I called her every, like, you're incompetent. Da, da, da. I said horrible things about my wife. I'm not proud of it. And my kids are, and the kids started crying. All of them. They're like, dad has lost his mind. <laughs> I was fit to be, t actually, I should have been in a straitjacket. I was so upset. And then we drove back to the to condo we were renting, and I was, I actually had to leave the house. That's how upset I was. And then the Lord's like, what are you doing? And then what happens is you say bad things, and then you add damage. To, so it was really bad. So finally, I had to go back, and I had to apologize to the children. I had to apologize to my wife. I had to say, listen, what I said was completely wrong. I'm glad you're enjoying it at my expense, everybody. But that's, I mean, that's an opportunity where you just have an opportunity to have self-control. And I, you know, what I should have said is like, man, what are you doing? Hey, you should have done that. Okay, well, let me take 20 minutes away and come back. Uh, it, it, seriously, if it's that bad, I'm serious. We mentioned last week about you got the lizard brain going on. You got the fight or flight part of your brain going on. The cerebral cortex takes a, takes a hiatus. And now you're in the emotional part. Best thing to do is, you know what? I'm really upset right now. I'm, I need about 20 minutes. And go away and collect your thoughts. Do not stay in the van. Do not stay in the room. Go quickly. Run. Or you'll say something. You'll and you know what the problem is? I forget what I said. But the kids, the kids still remember. So would you please pray for us? <laughs> so that's what happened. But the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way unto him, Who's the head of Christ? Speaking the truth in love. And that's what has to happen. And so, when, guys, take ownership. I blew it big time. I did. I blew it big time. I took responsibility for it. I asked the kids for repentance. I said, guys, I was wrong. And I still struggle with this. I do. When I'm tired and things are not going well, sometimes it's very easy to get in the nag mode, right? So what are you saying? Is it, is it, is it true, but is it in love? And actually... You know, true, you know what truth really is? The biblical word, definition of truth is not what the world says. The world says truth is facts that are correct. That's not truth. That's worldly truth. Godly truth is facts plus the love of God equals truth. Facts plus the love of God equals truth. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the what? Truth. truth. I am the life. Okay, so just because you're saying the thing that's factually correct does not mean it's truth. You can take, the tr you can take facts and use it as a weapon. So you can win the argument and slay your marriage, destroy your child, destroy a church, destroy relationships. But if you take the facts and you marry it and you put God's love in it, that's real truth. And sometimes truth has to knock down to build back up but it's always in that way. You can kill with facts. And so, you know, I read about the restoration. There's a fire in a museum, and they have a priceless painting, and they're trying to restore that painting. You know what they do? They, they, they put it in a special room. They clean it the best they can, and you know what they do? They take a little cotton Q-tip, something like it, and they take a little cleaning, and they just a little bit go around the painting, take away the smoke stains and the smudge, and they do this in order to protect the original painting. I'm so glad God has been patient with me. God many times says, man, he's got a long way to go, but let's go ahead and take a little off here. And he constantly is patient with me because he sees who I'll be and he sees who you will be. Why don't we give each other some grace? You're not God. I make a lousy God and so do you. Why not say the truth and let God work on the person? You don't need to nag someone to death. Nagging never works. It's like a dictatorship. They'll do what you say when you nag. Well, once you leave, they'll go back to the thing. 
So just let God change you a little bit by a little bit, and that's how you restore a painting, and that's how you restore your life. You see, the truth in love, washing with the word, washing with the word of truth. And this is the truth. We create our world with our words. We reap what we sow. We reap more than you will sow, and there's a time delay between what you say and what you receive. And most of all, speak facts with the love of God and let the truth set your relationships free and you free. Listen, everybody, I, I stand up here not mastering this at all. And uh, I thank God for his grace. I thank God that he is helping me along this process. But I, I, pray, I think all of us have room to grow in this area, do we not? Absolutely, we do. And do not let the culture around us shape us. If we're watching, I, I, this is between you and me, <laughs> between, you, this is between you and God, excuse me. But if you're watching shows where they're just lambasting each other with swear words and they're t speaking, and you're watching political programs where they're just throwing vitriol, why do I want to be around that kind of nonsense? Because you know what? It will get on you. And you'll start repeating what you're saying. So wash our mouths. Let the Lord touch our mouths and change our lives. Amen? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much that you're a good God. I want to thank you, God. You don't give us what we deserve, but you give us something called mercy and you give us grace. And Lord, I thank you for being so patient with me. Lord, all of us, you've been so patient with us, God. Lord, if we treated each other like you treated us, we'd be so much better. Father, thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for loving us. God, all of us in this room and those that are watching, we've all been guilty of speaking death. Lord, we submit our tongues to you today, recognizing that we've said hurtful things, we've done hurtful things. Lord, we've spoken death. Father, we want to give you our tongue. Lord, instead, we want to wash each other with the word. We want to speak words of life, words of truth. In Jesus' name. I want to, just as the worship team comes up, I have one more story to tell you that Jimmy Evans talks about in his excellent book called Marriage on the Rock. He talks about this, and this is a closing thing to think about. There was this couple that was infertile. They could not have children. They tried and tried and tried and tried. They had fertility tests. Everything should be working, but they could not for years, three or four years. So they finally go to the pastor's office, ask that the doctor said, go see your pastor, because I don't know what's going on. And he asked the question, what's going on? What's going on? Through investigative, of asking her questions, she began to break down and cry. She said, when I was a teenage girl, about 16, I was promiscuous. I got involved with some boys sexually. And she says, my, my mother was so upset with me. She says, the way you're acting, you'll never have kids. And she said, she's always felt shame from that. And she realized that cut her to the core. And the pastor said, listen, we need to get rid of this. Number one, your mother's a great woman. But she had a moment of weakness, and she probably didn't mean what she said. She says, well, you need to forgive your mother, and that's not true. You're, clean by, you're cleansed by Jesus Christ. His blood is enough to take away your sins, your failures, and you can be seen as new and clean and pure. And she cried, she, and they, they prayed for each other. You know what happened? They had four or five kids afterwards. So... That's the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. My question is, where are you with God today? Have you let the blood of Christ wash you of your sins? Because all of us blow it. No one here is even close to being right with God. It's only by what Christ has done. No one in the world is good enough. Only one. And that's the person who came 2,000 years ago, stood in your place, and broke his tree in two and stands right now. He is the conduit. He is the pathway. There's no way to God except through Jesus Christ. Every world religion has to go to the feet of Jesus or they cannot come to God. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He is the only life. There's only one way to the Father. It's through Jesus Christ. My question is, have you gone through Jesus Christ? I'm not going through good works. I'm not going through trying to come to church and pray. You know, this is all great. This supports the main thing. But without having a relationship with God, this is very... Futile. Have you given your life to Christ? I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. If you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time, 
Or maybe you walk with God for a period of time, you've walked away. Today is the day of salvation. Do not delay. Do not wait. Because your heart is saying yes, jump on it now because you may not care later on. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, today's the day. Maybe you used to walk with God and you walked away. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to meet my eyes. I'm going to look around the room. You raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. Oh, I want to renew my commitment because I've fallen away. Come on, let's be real. Anyone this morning? Keep your hands. Thank you. Anyone else as I look around? Thank you. Anybody else this morning? Okay, let's, let's go ahead and pray. Anyone I'm watching online? Say this with your heart. It's not, it's your heart connected to Christ. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I choose to receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross and paid for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose to turn away from what I know is wrong. Today, I step away. I step down from being in charge of my life. This is not my life. It's your life. You're number one. You are my God, and I am not. Fill me now with your presence and help me on this path in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that.